Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first colloquium of this term. Today, we're very happy to have Oscar Varela. He is an associate professor at Utah State University and a research fellow at IFT Madrid. He uh, is also on sabbatical here this uh, entire academic year, so many of you have probably seen him around. Um, Oscar did his PhD at Valencia University and then went on to do postdocs at um, Imperial College, Max Planck, Utrecht, and Harvard. Um, he works on quantum gravity, holography, on field theory, string theory, and today we'll talk about exceptional holography. Yes. So thank you, Rita, and thank you for the, um, uh, for the invitation to, uh, to speak here today. Um, Today I'm going to speak about um, some research I've been uh, I've been doing over the last uh, maybe two or three years or so related to um, to holography, and so I'm going to uh, to uh, gradually motivate it uh, from you know from a quantum gravity perspective, um, and the uh, and the exceptional bit will come later as we as we speak. So. Um, we know that um I like go oh, if you click on the screen and then you go away. Um, yeah. There. Oh. Okay, yeah. Sorry about that. Well, we know that um the quantum gravity in some sense presents uh holographic aspects in the sense that um in the sense that uh, under some circumstances, the uh, rather than degrees of freedom, rather than contained in a volume, or rather uh, described or confined uh, into um, some surface uh, of space, and that's quite apparent from um, from the uh, bekenstein hawking entropy formula corresponding to. Uh, to uh, to black holes, that famously says that the uh, that the entropy scales like the uh, like the area of the uh, of the horizon. So obviously that's uh, that's the first indication that uh, um, you know that uh, the degrees of freedom that would be described in the microscopic states accounting for the um, Thermodynamical entropy of the black hole should be, uh, you know, contained within uh, within uh, the area of the horizon rather than the uh, the volume of the surrounding uh, surrounding space. So, if you want to explore the uh, holographic features of, of quantum gravity at this point, you might want to uh, to follow two routes. Uh, you might want to follow the uh, so-called, or what you might want to think of as a bottom-up approach, where you try and, uh, you know, infer uh, features of this holographic dictionary, what comes into the field theory side of things and what comes into the gravity side of things by, you know, consistency conditions, effectively. And that's the... Um, that's the line of the main line of thought of approaches like celestial holography, for example. Alternatively, you might want to follow a top-down uh, prescription, where you start from a well-defined theory of quantum gravity and study its holographic properties. Then, now this pros and cons to either approach. Uh, the bottom-up approach, you know, starts from the ground up and you, you know, try and construct your gravity, your quantum gravity theory as you speak, so to say. And from a top down perspective, you do start from a well-defined quantum theory of gravity, but that is a well-defined theory of quantum gravity doesn't really mean that it is the quantum theory of gravity that describes nature out there. So from... That point of view, you know, well, there's pros and cons to do it after each approach, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to follow the uh, this top down, this top down uh, prescription, and in particular, I'm going to focus on, um, you know, a type of holography that appears in 
in string theory as a quantum theory of, uh, of gravity. And the concrete realization, I'm going to focus uh, in this talk about the, uh, the holographic principle is the so-called gauge gravity correspondence or ADS-CFT correspondence, which conjectures that uh, string theory or quantum gravity in antidecitor space is dual to a field theory living in, in the boundary of, of antidecitor. And that field theory is of a certain special type uh, that, um, uh, that makes it conform, that is invariant under under scale, under scale transformations. Okay, so a particular example that one might want to, uh, if you want to be, you know, precise or you know, have a concrete model in in mind, is type to be strings on ADS five times S five is dual to a supersymmetric version of the Anders theory. Okay. Anyway, these details are not going to be very important for what I. What the message I want to convey today. I'm just setting up my model here in my background. Okay. Now, having a, a top down prescription or a top down approach is, is helpful because, um, because you have a, a holographic dictionary in place. In other words, you can relate quantities on either side of the correspondence and you have a you know a good idea of what the match would be unlike in bottom up approaches for example so the entries in the holographic dictionary of ads cft i'm going to focus on today are these these two excitations above the anti your anti the background correspond to observables um, in the in the boundary that is operators of the of the dual CFT. And excitations over ADS are characterized by some mass. Okay, and that mass relates to the conformal dimension of the operators in the in the boundary. Okay, so these are the the two or the uh, the example of in the within the holographic dictionary I want to I want to focus on today so excitations map to observables on the boundary and calculating the mass their mass over antidecitor space corresponds to determining the dimension of the corresponding dual operator. Yeah. All right, another feature of uh, ADS CFD that is going to be kind of relevant uh, for the purposes of this talk is that is that ADS CFT is a is a weak strong duality. Okay, what that means is that it maps the strongly interacting region on one side to the weakly interacting uh, to a weakly interacting prescription on the other side of the correspondence. In practice that is well that is great because in, in Principle it allows you to compute things from you know mildly curves, gravitational effects, uh, or, you know, make you know uh, uh, predictions about strongly coupled field theory from you know using mildly interacting gravity. But in practice, um, that has some consequences as well, which is that even in you know top-down prescriptions like ads CFT, sometimes the Holographic duals, the, 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 the field theory duals are not known. And in from this point of view, you're in a similar situation as what happens with bottom-up constructions. Okay. So the best thing you can the best thing you can do in these situations is to um, use your gravitational description to make predictions about what the dual CFT would be, pretty much like you're doing a bottom-up approach. So from that point of view, you're in a similar situation. And this kind of situation where the field theory dual to the 
um, uh, the gravity on ADS is not known, is relatively common. Okay, so uh, is is relatively common because the uh, the it's um, uh, the way you typically find and the situ solution is by engineering them uh, using the uh, the building blocks you've got in in string theory, like you know brains and uh, taking the near horizon. Uh, limits of, of those or constructing those anti-decitor solutions directly as solutions to the uh, supergravity equations. And uh, in you know most situations or in many situations, it turns out that you don't really know what the field theory tuple is. Okay, so um, you do know though that you should have some sort of correspondence and therefore your task would be is knowing this particular realization of antidecitor space within string theory, how do I gather uh, information about the corresponding field theory dual? Okay. All right. Suppose that I focus on the particular entry I, I mentioned about excitations over antidecitor space corresponding to dual operators. Okay. And I'm in a situation where I do not necessarily know the dual field here. All right, so how do I gain information about the dual conformal field theory? Well, um, if I manage to compute a set of excitations over anti-decitor space, I'll be able to figure out what the uh, spectrum of operators of that field theory is. Okay. There's a number of excitations you might consider, you might want to consider the bar and the city space, but a relatively accessible one is the, uh, the spectrum of Kaluza Klein excitations. All right, so remember that we're in a, in a string theory context. Well, that means that the practical purposes were, uh, we're, we're living in 10 dimensions say, or 11, I apologize for that. <laughs> um, and I consider my background space within that 10 dimensional setup to be composed of, say, five dimensional anti sitter space times a five dimensional spin. Okay, so ADS, I'm on ADS5 times S5. Okay, my 10 dimensional space time factorizes in that way. The excitation, and, and then under the center space, four dimensional, uh, four dimensional Minkowski space, uh, where the field theory, the dual field theory uh, is supposed to live, is some sort of slice within this ADS5 factor in my space time. Okay? And what I'm saying is that whatever the field theory is, that lives on that five, four dimensional Minkowski, Minkowski space, its operators or a set of its operators is going to be related to the Kaluza Klein excitations above ADS5 space. And one of the, uh, you know, re like I say, relatively accessible set of excitations about ADS5 space correspond to deformations of that internal five sphere. Okay, so fluctuations above that um, internal phase sphere. These operators is a this set of operators is a very is a very uh, you know is a is a particular set within the full set of operators if I would have considered, but is an interesting one and is like I say relatively accessible relatively. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on. Excitations, Kaluza Klein excitations about ADS space, how to compute them, how it's difficult to compute them, and how to you know go around the traditional method of computing them, which turns out to be quite complicated. Oh, pardon me. Um, you, uh, you say that uh, the, the that the uh, spectrum is um, is of order one. What is setting the scale? What is what is one with respect to? These are dimensionless numbers. So 
one is an absolute number. Okay. So one is really <laughs> in dimension less units. So what that means is that uh, or dimension with respect to well, the other one is your dimension of or your space time. Four dimensions is for your yeah, dimensionless numbers. And this is really one because it's in, really one because in, 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 in astrophysics people will say order one when they really mean like ten thousand. Oh yeah, no, this is really one. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay, so what I want to talk about is really some sort of, you know, calculation of perturbations within some gravitational background. And even though the methods that I'm going to use or the, uh, you know, techniques that eventually I'm going to employ are quite different, this is relatively similar in spirit at least to, you know, uh, Perturbations that one might want to consider in other similar, relatively similar situations in black hole physics, for example. So the type of perturbations we're considering here are akin to the calculation of, say, for example, pausing on the modes or uh, tidal perturbations of, uh, of, of black holes, log numbers. Like I say, uh, the methods involved might be, you know, perhaps different, and in particular, you know, all the uh, techniques that one employs to to uh, determine collective and spectra are mostly algebraic versus, in these cases, one needs to integrate differential equations. But barring those fundamentally different dimensions. Though. The love number and the quantum number. You can consider them in different dimensions. What I'm saying is that you're, morally speaking, at least, I'm doing more of the same. So even though this is fancy, I'm I'm dressing things with fancy language that I'm you know, computing conformal dimensions of dual operators and whatnot. What I'm doing is I'm having some background space and I consider perturbations above it, and I want to compute what those perturbations are and what the spectrum of those perturbations are. If I want to compute causing all modes of black holes, what I need to do is have a you know black hole background, shoot a, say, scalar into it, and see how it vibrates down. Okay? And I do that by setting boundary conditions, appropriate boundary, boundary conditions, and integrating the wave equation. Same thing here. Okay. So we're more or less speaking about, about the same the same thing. Uh, usually the physics goes into the boundary conditions. So it's mostly apart from you know dimensions and things like that. We're talking about different boundary conditions. All right. So anyways, what we um, we want to do is to compute uh, Kaluza-Klein spectra of the uh, of the solution. So let me start to going back to basics and uh, and review the um, the basic Kaluza-Klein idea that was proposed by these gentlemen about uh, almost one hundred years ago. Kaluza is later developed by. My, my namesake, Oscar Klein. Suppose that uh, rather than starting from the conventional GR in a four dimensional space time, you write down your Einstein Hilbert term, Einstein Hilbert Bronjan, but in one dimension higher. Say they go to, uh, to five dimensions, and I've used these hats to symbolize that I'm in. Uh, in a five-dimensional situation. But other than that, that's that's what probably looks like in five dimensions. And now I'm gonna assume that my space-time is factorized as a four-dimensional space-time and a compact direction, a circle. Intuitively, if I do that, I'm actually, uh, from the four-dimensional slice point of view, what I'm doing is I'm Fourier expanding all my fields in this direction, this circle direction. 
And what I end up is with an infinite tower of closed supply modes labeled by harmonics on the circle, by you know, the Fourier number on the circle. And I've got an infinite number of them that from a four dimensional perspective look like gravitons, vectors, and scales. Okay. The original idea of colored line is that the zero modes, the modes of mass, the, of, of zero mass, turn out to fill out a, a theory by themselves that looks like gravity and electromagnetism with an extra scalar turn. This, particularly finding these non-zero modes, is the problem we want to address in the ADS five times stuff kind of context. Okay. okay. I've set up some analogy with black hole physics, but there's a very straightforward analysis with quantum uh, mechanics 101 as well. Okay, because at least in the uh, baby example of five-dimensional calot line, um, you know, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between different things. Like, for example, the masses I just talked about correspond to energy eigenstates in the uh, time-independent Schrodinger equation. And, you know, these uh, calot line modes correspond to the uh, to the eigenstates to the wave functions of the uh, of, of the Schrodinger equation, the time of the Schrodinger equation. So there's a direct analogy, and later on I might present you know, different, you know, more complicated versions of this story. But Molly Stiggins again, this story. Suppose that in your Schrodinger equation you choose a potential to be the Coulomb potential. And you want to focus on bound states. Well, solving the uh, hydrogen atom uh, in in this case. So, if the uh, the Schrodinger equation for the Coulomb potential, the solution is known to have you know, the, you know these famous eigen energies and um, and the uh, the corresponding eigen states. In this particular example, the solution is easy to find because you've got a lot of symmetry. Involved, but you got an extra. You you got a, a, an obvious SO three symmetry, rotational symmetry. But it turns out that in the vanilla hydrogen, you got a hidden SO three, uh, which is you know more symmetry than you expected somehow. Recall that in other cases where you have less symmetry, like for example, where you include a fine uh, the fine structure corresponding to uh, to relativistic effects, or you put your hydrogen atom in some external magnetic field where the symmetry is reduced accordingly, you know, the system gets more complicated. And in fact, the spectrum for the Zeeman effect um, is only on numerically, or can be solved only numerically, okay? It still can be solved, but, uh, but the problem definitely gets more complicated. What I, was, I, I suppose I, one of the messages I want to convey here is that the more symmetry you have in your problem, in your spectral problem, the easier it is to, uh, to solve it. And the same thing is going to be uh, happening here. Okay, so this is the setup I want to do. Translate the old, you know, vanilla uh, idea of color supply into this ADS five times some compact in tonal space kind of scenario and compute <laughs> the color supply modes. Okay. So I said that 5D color line is easy. Looks like you know the um, the hydrogen atom situation, but it turns out that for practical purposes, in this ADS five ADS time something in, within a string theory context, computing the color line spectrum is quite hard <laughs> because even for the simplest type of cases. Setting up the problem requires a real tool of force, okay? Because there are more fields, there are more dimensions, there are background, there's background curvature, unlike in the 5D situation. Okay. 
Okay, so what does the uh, standard spectral method involve? There's a number of cases you need to go through, and um, you know, even for the simplest cases, these are you know complicated steps to to take. It nevertheless can be done. But the, uh, for example, the linearizations of the uh, ten-dimensional supergravity equations look like this. Uh, this was done like back in the eighties, and uh, this is the analog of your Schrodinger equation now. So it's pretty nasty. Can be done, and people computed the spectrum of type two B and ADS five and organized it in this nice way. So it can be done, and it was done with a lot of effort for the simplest type of solution. Okay, so this all this standard method definitely doesn't work in more complicated cases, which is, you know, the typical cases that you'd find in, in ads you know, this, this is not workable. What do these points represent? These points represent um, states in your spectrum. It's organized in terms of vectors, uh, in terms of the, uh, or vectors with respect to the anti theta factor, scalars, and some other texts. This gravity does as well, but they don't write it. And the points label, uh, they come in quantum numbers of your symmetry group. Okay, in ADS5 times S5, your symmetry is SO6, and these are representations of SO6. Yeah, joint, for example, 15. Okay. This is not the way to go in general. Okay, so the uh, this was this calculation was done in the eighties by uh, Newman Huysen et al., which is was one of the um, inventors of supergravity. And uh, it's fair to say that uh, no other progress has been done since then until quite recently. And the uh, game changer here was kind of related to the spectacle gentleman. Does anybody know who this guy is? Well, I didn't know until yesterday until I put up this, this presentation. This gentleman is a Frenchman called Elie Cartan, who classified the uh, symmetry groups long ago, uh, almost 100 years ago as well. Um, and the story I'm going to unfold now is related to symmetries, hidden symmetries in this business. Okay. Recall that the more symmetry you have in a spectral problem, the easier it is to find the solution. But it turns out that under some circumstances, we've got a lot of hidden symmetry, which is kind of an exceptional thing like this guy was, but exceptional turns out to be a technical word as well. Okay. Go back to GR, conventional GR, 4D GR. Okay. Or, well, 4D GR in any dimensions you want, or D dimensions, whatever, whatever you want. And reduce it on a torus. Generalize the Kalut Sakline idea. Turns out that the reduced theory has an obvious modular symmetry, GLN. GLN is the symmetry of the torus, but typically it has more symmetries, it has more. Uh, hidden symmetries, symmetries that are not obvious, but are nevertheless there and require some effort to work them out. For example, plain GR, 4D GR, on a circle, or for axisymmetric solution, that's the same thing as saying, you know, 4D GR on a circle, has an obvious U1 symmetry, the axisymmetric direction, but in fact, it has a hidden SL2 symmetry, which goes under the name of the um, Ehlers group, typically. You might have heard of the Gerrard group as well. Ehlers is a German physicist, or used to be a German yeah, he died. Uh, but there's a, another realization of this in terms of the Gerrard group from, uh, you know, by name after Bob Gerrard. Um, this hidden symmetry story is, uh, well, it has some applications. The one I'm going to focus on today is related to, uh, you know, a rewrite of a, com a convenient rewrite 
of the uh, of your spectral problem in some in some sense. But before I do that, let me remind you that in fact all this hidden symmetry business is quite helpful. It has some physical applications even in plain GR or in black hole physics. There's a question. In the previous slide, what is what exactly is the GLM? What exactly is what? The GLM. Oh. GLN is the symmetry of TN. So the symmetry of T2 is like, uh, like modulo. GL2. Okay. So the symmetry of T of, of a circle would be just a U1. Yeah. And, it, and what, what's special is that this SL2 is not obvious. Because the obvious part is just a, is just a U1 inside SL2. But like a T2 isn't like usually the modulo group T2 and SL2 group? And T2 would be a GL2, I guess, or SL2. But it, what I'm saying is that you'd be reducing, you'd be, you'd be reducing, say, five or if you, used to, you know, if you start from, say, uh, four dimensions and reduce an T2, the obvious symmetry would be a GL2. Okay. But effectively, you're in two dimensions, and then the symmetry is infinite. It's the Gerber group, so it gets enhanced to uh, to, uh, to an infinite dimensional group. If you start, if you stop reducing above three dimensions, all the, the groups you find are finite. Right. Anyway, that's what happens here in uh, in, uh, in in plain GR. Uh, you start with the um with the uh, with a short sailed with a short sailed black hole turns out that you can use these hidden symmetries to up charge to it and it turns out that the rise the nostrum uh charge black hole which is shown here uh on the bottom can be obtained from from short sail through uh one of these uh hidden symmetry transformations which is um you know which is uh which is what gives you an idea of the uh, the power of these uh, of these of these symmetries, okay, within this particular context. All right, so it so does that there's another occur as well. Like you can do, is, can you do like an SL two like transformation of current get current Uh, presumably, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't, can't tell you off the top of my head, but uh, presumably Gaudium is related to is to related to current that way as well, some similar way. All right, so the more fields you add to your gravitational setup to your GR, the bigger the symmetries you get. Okay, so um, so um, for example, if you start with a theory that contains Gravity, so this would be your Einstein Hilbert term in say 11 dimensions, and you decorate it with extra field, say a three uh, index tensor with three and four field strength. This is the postonic Lagrangian of 11 dimensional supergravity, incidentally. And you reduce on a torus to four dimensions, say the symmetries you get in four dimensions are of exceptional type. The exceptional type classified by Cartan. Okay? So in four dimensions, that would be E7. This E7 symmetry is kind of hidden in the four-dimensional situation, but, um, but it's nevertheless there. One of the things you might want to consider is, is this exceptional symmetry an artifact of the toroidal reduction? Does it arise because I'm you know, reducing the theory to a lower dimension and it's and it's all, it's only present in the lower dimensional situation. And um, it turns out that uh, the uh, the existence of this hidden symmetry is more interesting than that because it can be fleshed out directly in the high dimension. In other words, there's a reformulation of your high dimensional theories that make these exceptional symmetries manifest. There's a number of approaches uh, to do that. One of them is called exceptional field theory, which is the sort of background theory I'm working on. Okay. 
from this point of view, what I'm saying is that there was another question. Yeah, just to make sure. I mean, when you say symmetry, you mean like a symmetry of the full spectrum, right? Like it could mutate some of the massive more some of the massive. Um, I haven't got there yet, but I'm talking about symmetries at the level of the zero modes. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm saying with the uh, the fact that these dualities are realized within the high dimensional theories is that in some sense they should be viewed as well as part of you know the web of string dualities. So I'm not. I'm recovering a particular corner here within uh, within the uh, the landscape of of string dualities. Let's go back to Carlton Klein on ADS times M. Mm -hmm. One of the virtues of using this exceptional approach or using these uh, hidden symmetries is that your high dimensional theory becomes or looks like, at least on paper, as if it was lower dimensional already. So fleshing out the modes is definitely easier than it was using the, the conventional approach. The problem really becomes uh, tractable now, and it just reduces to just conventional matrix diagonalization. Okay, so to go back to the list of uh, to do uh, to do things you got to do to uh, implement the spectral problem using the standard method, things simplify considerably, and you're able to uh, perform the uh, the or compute the spectrum for a number of interesting solutions that uh, that arise uh, within string theory that contain anti-dissident factors, and these are just examples of them. As a, I'm not going to focus. I'm not going to just go in, you know, into the details for for sure. But uh, uh, I want to give you a, an idea that the sort of uh, fluctuations we're computing on is this kind of this kind of background. So we've got a ten-dimensional metric containing an antecedent factor with some uh, internal space that corresponds to some sort of topological sphere here, um, and this geometry is supported by other fields that have complicated profiles on the internal space. Okay. Using the uh, standard approach to compute fluctuations above this background would be just inviable. There's, there's no way you can do it. But using these methods, computing the spectrum of beasts like this <laughs> becomes feasible and and uh, well, very uh, intuitive. So, Dominic, you had a question? Uh, so are these uh, hidden symmetries are global symmetry or they gauge symmetry? These are global. These these exceptional symmetries are global. Okay. Yeah, there's a num there's a number of uh, details that I'm, that I'm not. Uh, is that CP like charge parity? No, no. This this is the complex projected one. Okay. Anyway, this is an illustration of the sort of thing that you want to. Is the dual known here? What? What's the dual here? The dual is known, everything is known here. So there's a number of checks you need to do this formalism. Does it say a BGM? It's, re it's related to it, it's related to ABGM. Anyway, so there's a number of things you can compute. For, for example, the individual uh, uh, individual masses of gravidons, for example. You can compute uh, the scalars, all scalars of dimension less than three, for example, uh, which gives you, uh, you know, an idea of what the uh, relevant and marginal deformations of your field theory deal would be. You can compute the short spectrum and match it to the super conformal index of the known field theory. You can compute dimension formally for the uh, <clears throat> super multiplex arising in the, uh, in the compactification. So you got all of that. Um, for n equals two solutions, for n equals one, you got you know you got a, a bunch of data that you that you obtain from these from these methods that using the traditional approach would be just uh, would be just uh, out of out of reach. Okay, so I think I'm going to conclude with this in the next slide, uh, with noting uh, first 
some noteworthy features of this uh, formalism, which is the following: the um, um, the this these techniques can be used even even if you don't know the full solution within string theory. So you don't need to know the full uh, the the full how the full solution looks like in this example, for example. In this case, we do know the full solution, but uh, in general, you only need to know that this solution arises within some reduced supergravity framework, which is a considerable simplification to knowing the full solution. The only remnant of the internal of the internal spheres is through some constant matrices that you can uh, use in, in some mass matrices to diagonalize them. And those diagonalization can be performed level by level. So eventually you're translating an infinite dimensional eigenvalue problem into, uh, you factorize it into a finite dimensional ones of more and more dimension. Eventually your computer code suffer but that's the both of us first. Okay. In case, I guess this is not particularly relevant, but in case you're you know, wondering whether supersymmetry is doing anything here for you, it's actually doing nothing. So the supersymmetry is, is not relevant. There's of course a number of uh, things that I uh, haven't told you. <laughs> And uh, research is is now, or I'm, I'm doing active research in, in trying to uh, sort these things. Um, because this, uh, this is a very successful approach, but for a limited type mm -hmm. of cases, if you want. Okay, so cases that arise as back here of some uh, lower dimensional supergravity or the fact that one thing one one of the things that go into that goes into the formalism is the fact that those cases of gravity need to be embedded in a particular way within the full set of string theory. That particular way goes into the main mode consistent truncation. It's a technicality that I want I don't want to discuss, but just to summarize, the uh, these are spectral methods that uh, are uh, um, that become available when one uses or one um, takes advantage of the exceptional hidden symmetries of supergravities are very powerful. Um, at the moment, though, we can only use them for a limited set of solutions. And there's the interesting or an interesting situation would be to relax the assumptions that led into the derivation of the mass matrices to use them in the general situation. So thanks BHI for listening and I'll take uh, any other questions. Thanks. Uh, my understanding is that normally when you do these spectral methods, you have to like construct in the vacuum and then you build off on the vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know what the vacuum is? Yeah, this is a schematic representation of the vacuum. Yeah. This is a concrete realization of the vacuum. This is a vacuum solution of your equations of motion. And you solve the equations of motion uh, with these fields, and that solves the equations of motion. You know it's a vacuum because it's an anti -decita. It's got an anti -decita factor. So that's the type of vacuum you're getting. And on top of these, you're considering fluctuations of these fields. And those are the, these results. You know, I've, I've flashed these results as the, uh, you know, the fluctuations of mass uh, two, three, and, and so on. Okay? And there's an infinite number of them, just like in color supply, regular color supply. Yeah. So uh, I, I do worry about supersymmetry. You so do worry about I, I do. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could clarify, because it seemed like you made two contradictory remarks on this uh, right one after another. You said supersymmetry plays no role, but then you said you must assume that the ADS 
uh, solutions or vacuum That's up right. those That's theories. Right. Can you please clarify yeah. exactly uh, what what supersymmetry is and it's not doing or it, where it is and it's not required? Supersymmetry is an umbrella that it may, that is really making the whole formalism work for you. Yes, it was. It was so perhaps I didn't phrase it in a in a in a in a correct way. Um. Um. Supersymmetry is helpful to uh, to make the formalism work and reduce it to matrix diagonalization uh, as opposed to having to integrate differential equations like you do if you were doing quasi normal melting black holes, for example. So that's what supersymmetry is doing that is doing for you, turning a differential problem into an algebraic problem. Once you're there, for the individual solutions, it doesn't play any further role. But yeah, this perhaps this is a this was a this statement wasn't very precise. So, so then, if, if, um, if, is it correct uh, to think that supersymmetry is being used purely as a simple uh, a simplificational yeah. tool, so to speak? But it's yeah. but it's not really involved in any of the yeah. physics. It's not involved in physics. Okay, thank you. Yeah, again. Oh, sorry, I can share. Oh, I can do it. Sorry. Uh, just I wanted to ask. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I, you flashed uh, a picture of Cartan earlier. The spectral method similar to like what he does for semi simple Lie groups, or well, he classified the uh, his, he classified the semi simple Lie groups, and um, and he found that there's a that there's a there's a number series that he called um, the regular series A, B, C, and D, and then there's a there's some exceptional series, and the uh, and the reason why they're exceptional is because among among other things, they not they're finite, unlike the uh, unlike the regular series. So this semi simple Lie groups of exceptional type, <laughs> and there's a handful of them. There's four or five of them, and these are exceptional symmetries are the ones that appear as in some, some corners of the uh, you know, string duality space of within a string. That Cartan didn't know back then, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, and, and in fact, um, the, the fact that these exceptional symmetries do arise as symmetries in, in lower dimensional supergravities was known since the 70s or 80s, 70s, I suppose. The realization of those duality symmetries within a fully fledged string theory setup is, is much more recent. It's, it's from 10, 12 years ago. In the, like the symmetry between the, the, the Schwarz shield and the like Carson and Nordstrom, yeah. example, does that mean that, like, is that saying that both are like solutions of the Nestle sector of the dimensionally reduced theory or because they have like different charges? Yeah, so this is a solution of GR and this is a solution of um, GR with a, with a Maxwell field. But if I set the Maxwell field to zero, I'm back in GR. So they, I'm, I'm regarding these as solutions of, of GR plus a Maxwell field. Mm -hmm. is, is that? Is that what you're asking? But uh, I guess like in what sense is the relation between them like a symmetry, like a symmetry of the work? Uh, I wouldn't say there's a, I wouldn't say there's a symmetry. What I'm saying is that the way these methods work is the following. Uh, you have a time-like direction here in 4D. You use it to formally reduce to three dimensions, okay? And you blindly do it. Don't don't worry that it's a it's a time like circle. Just do it, and you get to a three dimensional theory with weird signature because you already messed up. And formally, though, that three D theory is gravity coupled to scalars. You do transformations on the scalars. These SL two transformations on the scalars are a type of so two transformations on the scalars, uh, you uplift back to 4D and you get this metric. You don't get this on the nose. You really need to, need to get really hard to make you know, 4D transformations and so on to put it in this nice way. But that's essentially the idea. So I wouldn't say there's a symmetry. It's, there's a solution generating technique 
based on these hidden symmetries that allows you to go from one to the other through some convolute kind of way. Um, but I wouldn't say there's a there's a symmetry. These charges though, E and P, these are the electric and magnetic charges of the um, of the black hole. And what this method does for you is to generate them by uh, making SL2 transformations of that reduced theory and then uplifting back to 40. That's the way this method works. This is in these transformations of these kind of you know, symmetries appear in NGR, uh, but the exceptional symmetries of string theory are of this type as well. I suppose that I wrote this example as a particular illustration of this, these things. Yeah, I just want to when I think about symmetries, I, the intuition I have is that there's going to be a phase transition at some point. Is that applicable here, or does that come out in the structure of the mode? Conserved quantity. What's that? Or a conserved quantity. Or a conserved quantity. Or a conserved quantity. Yeah. So this is exceptional. So related, electric related. That's what these charges are. Yeah, these, these, these charges are the conserved, the conserved charges of these symmetries. Like, for example, in regular in regular Kaluza line, you don't have a U1 symmetry. And there's a, there's a conserved charge corresponding to gauge transformations of the gauge field. So it's the same sort of thing. Same, so, sort of idea. same sort of thing. This is the baby problem. And what I'm saying is I'm decorating this with extra dimensions, background curvatures, extra fields, and lots of stuff. But this is the basic idea. And that would, 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 would that lead to observables? That leads to observables. In the context I'm talking about, your observables live in the boundary of antitest interspace, live in the boundary, mm -hmm. and the observables are literally operators in your field theory. The, uh, the quantities that you're computing, for example, using the spectrum, is the dimension of those operators, the conformal dimension of those operators. So those those fields do lead to observables, but you know, from with this interpretation, with this holographic interpretation. So you don't get I don't think, you don't get observables that are not in the gravity. Okay. Or depends on how you define observable. Yes, I mean those fields would be your basic building blocks in the gravity, but I don't I don't want to deal with them like I would do like with quartz normal modes. Those would be the things that I would go and measure. Uh, you know, with ring downs and, and black hole matches and things <laughs> like that. I want to interpret these perturbations holographically. I'm interested in the gravity in the field theory side of things, and I'm just using gravity as a tool to compute field theory stuff. That's interpretation, and that's the attitude. Okay. So I suppose the analogy with tidal deformations or or causing all the modes is, is relevant in the sense that you're really perturbing your gravitational background and read off you know, um, perturbations above that background. The interpretation though, or the physical meaning or the physical motivation is different. Does that make sense? As much as I can understand it. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what did you say? The vacuum expectation value depends, right? So you have oh, okay, operators okay. and they translate into observables. I see. So I want to compare them on the other formal field theory yeah. side. I think maybe most of the holography that we've seen in the Colloquia is. Is where you use the CFT to learn something about ADS. And this is, you're doing the opposite direction. Yeah, 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 exactly. So for us, the interesting questions are in the CFT. Um, like in the lab, that would be an actual like, theory that you could make, well, not really, but yeah, it's more like, test. Well, yeah, but it's like difficult. I mean, like superconductor super conductor materials will, there's yeah, maybe some. But the same thing happens in, in, um, in uh, any uh, uh, potential dual field theory to, uh, to, to, to black holes, for example. You don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to figure it out from gravity data. Same sort of thing here. Okay, so this, this is no different in that 
from that point of view, the celestial holography problem. You don't know what the field theory is. You're trying to figure it out uh, you know, from, uh, uh, from quantities that you can compute in the gravity side. Same thing here, even, even if you have a, or even if you're in a top-down holographic construction, you don't necessarily know what the field theory is. And then you're trying to get information from the field theory by studying things in the, in the bulk, perturbations, for example. Um, yeah, maybe one question, and then maybe I can ask my question, and then we'll actually call it. Yeah, so going back to the uh, slide of going from Schwarzschild to Resonoption uh, using the same yeah. um, I have a question which is in the original theory, uh, in 4D, do you already have like resonant, uh, sorry, uh, Maxwell uh, Einstein in the theory? Sorry, what was your question? Yeah, so the, the solution is Schwarzschild. It doesn't have the uh, Maxwell field, but it's a theory you're reducing to 3D. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. uh, but, but, but these are in four dimensions. All, all these solutions are in four dimensions. These hidden symmetries kind of become obvious, so to speak, in the reduced theory, in the reduced three-dimensional setup. They become obvious there. But they're already there in four dimensions as well. I see. Okay. okay. It's, a, it's a way of phrasing it. I suppose it's semantics, but it's this can be mapped. If you go, it's it's relatively easy to map these two to go from one to the other. If you go the roundabout way of going to 3D and back to 4D. I wanted to ask something about the stuff that you were sweeping on the drug. Oh. Um, uh. <laughs> the first assumption that you said you might want to relax, I can sort of lean into it. But the second one, giving up on the consistent truncation, that seems kind of wild to me. It's pretty wild, yeah. Uh, I would, this, people have done made some progress in uh, in relaxing that uh, that assumption. Um, okay. It seems like you would lose all of the structure that you started with, or that to you lose part of the uh, algebraic power, and you end up having to integrate different equations. I see. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but but that's something still. And in some cases, it's still under control, and it's 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 interesting to try and relax this assumption because I mean this consistent truncation story is very special. Yeah, it's very special, and uh, uh, most of the uh, ADS CFT cases you want to you want to uh, you want to address uh, there'll be no no such framework. Yeah, so you want it. That's that's one of the things you want to you want to, to relax moving forward. Okay, I think maybe we should end it here and you can ask, ask for more over lunch. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.